how badly do Brent Venables and the Oklahoma Sooners need a victory in the Red River rivalry against Texas on Saturday? Spencer McLaughlin from Locked On College Football and I discuss on today's episode of Locked On Longhorns. You are Locked On Longhorns, your daily podcast on the Texas Longhorns. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Locked on Longhorns, the show. Jonathan Davis, your host. Today's episode of Locked on Longhorns brought to you by FanDuel. Place your first $5 bet and you'll get started with $200 in bonus bets guaranteed. So visit FanDuel.com to get started on today's episode of Locked on Longhorns, the Red River rivalry we discuss with Spencer McLaughlin from Locked on College Football. All of that and more on today's episode of Locked on Longhorns, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Also, my top five Heisman candidates. It's not on the graphic. You got to take my word for it if you're listening on audio, period. But my top Ashton five Heisman candidates in the third segment, yes. <laughs> Spoiler alert, he is number one. That dude, you know, better, be, that dude better be in there. <laughs> insane numbers. Like, I saw them put, like, the last three running backs that won it and, like, his numbers through the Not first five close. games. He is, their he, is, he is hundreds of like, yards ahead of where Derrick Henry was. 300 more yards. Point. Like yeah. No, no, no. I it's, know like, everybody's it's like four to 600 more yards. Then, then like Derrick Henry, it. Mark Ingram, and yeah, yeah. Any, anyway, anyway, sorry, I just you I, can't give it to I'm a G five there. But when he's like putting up like numbers like that, I mean, he, you come on, bro. Like, what are we doing? Like, he's he's, he's got to be number one right now. And there's no, I mean, I guess you could say Cam Ward, even though they keep like winning by the skin of their teeth. But there's no bona fide candidate to where you could just say, oh well. It's not Ashton Jinty's year. Like, it's Ashton Jinty's year, bro. Like, it just is. Like, it's insane. Kind of is. But anyways, it kind of seems like it right now. You know, this, this is, you know, we'll get to that in the third segment. So, Spencer, obviously one of the biggest games of the year on Saturday, even though Oklahoma has done everything in their power to not make it one of the biggest <laughs> games of the year <laughs> thus far. Texas number one, uh, Oklahoma number 18, Red River rivalry, um, must see TV every season. And when you look at it for the Oklahoma Sooners, right? I know this is locked on Longhorns, but we're going to start with the Sooners. Number 18 team in the country, year they're four and one. But that doesn't tell the story, really, of the Oklahoma Sooners from what I've seen, right? When you look at it, they beat Houston 16 to 12. That's probably a game that Houston should have won. They lose to Tennessee, and we all knew they would lose to Tennessee, but we did not expect a quarterback change. Jackson Arnold, the five star, to get benched in that game. And it just looked ugly. Then they're on the verge of losing to Auburn before the Auburn quarterbacks do what the Auburn quarterbacks do. And Peyton Thorne throws a pick six. So, yes, Oklahoma is four and one. But this is not the Oklahoma football team we are used to seeing. And so I ask you, Spencer, right, when you look at Brent Venables and you look at this Oklahoma team, it just feels like they need a signature win. Right. It just feels like they need a signature win. So to you, how badly does Brent Venables and the Oklahoma Sooners need a victory this Saturday against Texas? I, I think that depends on who you ask. You know, for me, I, I think Brent Venables and company would very much like to have a victory, but I didn't come into this season with high hopes for Oklahoma for three reasons. Number one, new quarterback. Number two, new offensive line. Number three, ridiculously brutal schedule. And we've already seen them lose to Tennessee. I think they're going to lose to Texas here. And that's not the end of their difficult games. They have a tremendously difficult SEC schedule. It's uh, it's hard to believe that they and Missouri are playing in the same conference because the caliber of their schedules, or even if you compare it to Texas's for that matter, they are not the same. They're, they're, they're just not the same. So I, I didn't come into this season thinking that you know Oklahoma would be a fantastic team or that they'd be an SEC title contender. I didn't think they were you know a three, four win team. But I had him in the 7-8 win range, and I've seen nothing to move me off of that perspective. So, you know, to, to go to your question, how badly does Brent Venables need it? From where I'm sitting, he doesn't need it at all. He wants it. Oklahoma fans should want the win. But I don't see this as a game where Brent Venables, you know, has to win or else the hot seat talk ratchets up or concerns should be way like, no, o Oklahoma right now is on perfect track to finish the season right where I expected them to be. And I think going into next year, they'll have an opportunity to be a much better football team. You'll have continuity at the quarterback position, whether they wind up going back to Arnold one day, unlikely, and they'll probably stick with, uh, with Hawkins, but he'll have a season under his belt. You can have some more experience along the offensive line, and you're going to have a lighter schedule. So 
I, I never looked at this as, as a game, and I don't coming into the week of, of Red River, which is always one of the best games, and as you said, must-see TV in college football. I don't look at it as it's a must-win for Oklahoma. It's a must-win for Texas. Everything stacks up in favor of the Longhorns here. I know there's no home field advantage, of course, and it's one of the few times where I'm okay with not playing a game like this on somebody's campus because it's the most uniquely awesome environment in all of college football. But for the Longhorns, everything is in front of them. Schedule works out favorably. They've already beaten Michigan on the road. They did so soundly. I I thought they would at the time, and they're coming off a bye. So too is Oklahoma, of course. But Texas has got the advantage. You've got quarterback continuity. I think you've got the better roster. And you're just playing at a level that I think is a lot higher than where Oklahoma has been this year. So I think it's much more of a must win for Texas than Oklahoma. If if Texas loses his football game, my opinion of the Longhorns changes significantly. Now, my view of Oklahoma changes as well, but it would not be as disappointing of a loss for Oklahoma to me as it would be if Texas were to lose this football game. I don't see them doing that. Certainly, I don't either, right? But when you look at the schedule, I think, you know, outside of this, the remaining schedule for Oklahoma, big games against Missouri and Alabama. I mean, you would say that, you know, Texas right now looks probably better than Missouri. Alabama is questionable, even though that's, you know, a horrible loss against Vanderbilt, right? Yeah. But it just kind of feels like, you know, when everybody talks about the mystique of Red River and, you know, throw out the records, throw out the roster and everything like that, it kind of feels like if Oklahoma can't get a victory on Saturday, will they be able to get a signature victory at all this year? Based on I, I, I think they, I, I think they can because their defense will keep them in games. I think Brent Venables, the biggest testament you can give to his ability to lead Oklahoma to where they want to go is that that defense over the last couple of years has improved dramatically to the point where it won them the football game against Auburn. The offense, I know they made a quarterback change and Oklahoma fans were clamoring for that and like, okay, but I think they had like 10 points going into the fourth quarter. You can you can do that against Auburn and get away with it and then Peyton Thorne will say, here you go, have the football game. I don't want to win. You can't do that against the teams on Oklahoma's schedule. They have to go at Ole Miss. They're, of course, playing Texas this week. They have to host South Carolina. I don't think that's an easy game. They have to go at Missouri, host Bama, at LSU to end the season. Can they win one or two of those football games? Yeah, when you have a defense like that, it can keep you around. If you're elite on one side of the ball, and I think Oklahoma is very good on on the defensive side of the ball, you can find your way. To, to polling what would definitely be viewed as an upset in my view. And I think in the betting market and the rankings, like uh, across the board, you know, going at Ole Miss, I think would be an upset win. Beating Bama will pro- would probably be an upset or LSU. I, I can see those things taking place because no one is really separating themselves in, in, in college football, broadly speaking. You know, Georgia was my preseason pick to win the national championship along with a lot of others. And they're still a really good team, but they're very vulnerable. And Alabama looked very good. But they just proved that they can be vulnerable, and we'll see how they respond. I, I suspect the Crimson Tide are, are going to beat the crap out of South Carolina this week uh, because I, I'm sure they're a little bit a little bit ticked off coming back home after blowing the game against Vandy a week ago. But I, I just don't see Oklahoma having the sort of season that you know our, our guy Jay Smith, the Locked On Sooners, predicted before the season when he said Oklahoma's winning the SEC. I was like, oh, I don't see that one there. Uh, my my guy, I love Jay, love, love love Jay, great dude. But I thought he was a, he had a little bit of crimson and cream colored glasses on there, and uh, I I just think this Oklahoma team, this is not 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 a reset year uh, of sorts, like not a rebuild year either, but just kind of a hold steady year, like avoid disaster. And I think that's fine. That's how I view this game for Oklahoma. I know Sooners fans will view it differently, but that schedule is just way too brutal. Yeah, for sure. You're making some good points before we get into, uh, you know, a word from our sponsors. I have to say that, you know, the Texas schedule, this is what all the Texas fans are saying, right? Everybody came into the season saying the schedule was cake, right? Even I said it, right? Okay. We probably got some favors. Now you look at it, Kentucky's beating the top 10 team, Arkansas's beating the top 10 team, Vanderbilt's beating the top 10 team. Actually, they were all top five when when those victories happened. So maybe this Texas schedule isn't as easy as we thought. We'll see. You know, uh, I mean, yes, just a quick word on that. I, I'm, I don't think all of those teams will play to that level every week. I think that they, they, they can, yeah. obviously, because they've done it before. 
South Carolina also took LSU down to the wire, and then Ole Miss went into that same stadium and blew them out 27 to 3. So I, I think those teams are very, very close to the middle of the conference. Right. One week wonders. All right. A quick break from our sponsors, and then we get into the second segment with Spencer McLaughlin talking about Red River rivalry uh, on Saturday. All right, today's episode of Locked on Longhorns brought to you by FanDuel. Hey, NFL fans, you can start the season with a big return on FanDuel, America's number one sports book. So when you get a hunch in the middle of the game, you can check out the latest stats, view live play-by-play, -play, and so much more on the same page where you place your bets. You'll get started with $200 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place your first $5 bet. That's FanDuel.com. Bet on your favorite team today. All right, bringing Spencer back in. So you talked – you know, really wonderfully about, you know, your expectations and just kind of what the Sooners football team is through five games, uh, you know, this season. And so I want to ask you, you know, with Texas being, you know, 14 and a half point favorites, I believe at this point, what are or what is right the realistic path to victory for the Sooners on Saturday? Because like I said, we can't just keep saying anything can happen in the Cotton Bowl, right? Like at the end of the day, it still comes down to coaching, quarterback, roster yeah which it seems like texas has the advantage in almost every facet right so we yeah. can't just say oh it's a rivalry game oklahoma has a chance right like well, you, know shoot. you took my number one answer away there jonathan because <laughs> you know, at like, some point like logic does play a factor right so right. What, is, I, what is the sooner's path to victory like, I, I think it's keeping the game low scoring i i do not look at this oklahoma offense even with hawkins back there and say oh well they, they've changed everything they're they're a powerhouse not like no, they, they could be a little bit better, but I watched them against Auburn. I wasn't that impressed. He made a couple really good throws. The deep ball late in the game, phenomenal throw. He came up clutch. I, I'm not trying to take away from him there. I'm just setting realistic expectations. I do not think Michael Hawkins is about to go crazy for 350 and four touchdowns and then lead a game-winning drive because I don't think they're going to be in a position to have a game-winning drive uh, by the time the fourth quarter rolls around. So, I look at Oklahoma and say, okay, defense is certainly their strength. Offense has been trying to figure things out. You have to keep this game low scoring. If, if and, and Oklahoma has to start strong because I have got no confidence, no confidence in that Sooners offense against this Texas defense, which I think has been uh, one of the more underrated units in college football this year. I've got no confidence in their ability to come back from 10 to 14 points down. If Texas comes out and jumps on them 14 to 3, I'm not going to turn the game off because I'm a sucker for college football no matter what. They'll all be calling a college football game. So, you know, maybe I maybe I will just like put put the phone down, not check it, watch something else during commercial breaks. You know, like, like that's just uh, I, I just don't see Oklahoma as being able to do that. So those would be the two keys. You've got to keep if you're Oklahoma, both teams under 30. I mean, I don't think Oklahoma is going to sniff 30 points in this football game. And you, you have got to be able to throw the first punch. If Oklahoma, like if, if, if Texas gets down, let's say Quinn Ewers, you know, throws a pick like he did last year to start the game and Oklahoma punches it in and then Texas goes three and out, Oklahoma gets field goal and they're up 10 nothing. Longhorns can come back from that. I've got no qualms. They can be explosive. They can be methodical. I love the way Sark calls an offense. I love the way he's worked in the new weapons this year. I think they've been really, really good. I think the Matthew Golden addition has, has been, um, or no, he was not a newcomer. This I'm throwing all sorts of names around in my well, head. Him, but him think, and Isaiah Bond, both newcomers. Okay, yeah. Uh, I'm oh, I'm thinking John Tay Cook is a guy who is, who, who's already there. But the Golden Edition, I think, is a really under-the-radar one. Like, I think a lot of people knew, oh, Isaiah Bond comes in, and Isaiah Bond, we, we know he's really good. Well, Silas Bolton's a great gadget guy, too. But when I watch this Texas offense, it can be any one of those guys. And, and they can hit you in the short game, intermediate, screens, deep shots, Everything is available there. And I, I know that Texas has that identity offensively. I don't think Oklahoma's found that identity. And it's why I look at them and say, if, if you pigeonhole them to be one dimensional, I don't even know if that's a dimension they could thrive in. So if Texas gets on them early, I think they're okay. And if Texas gets down early, I still think Texas can, can be okay. But your, your original question, how does Oklahoma win? Ride the defense, control the clock, got to be able to run the football at least a little. I don't think they need to go crazy because they run plenty of RPO and Hawkins will make some plays with his legs in the passing game, but they've got to be able to get off to a strong start because I do not trust their ability to come back. 
Yeah, it feels like, you know, Oklahoma, you know, being serious, I guess, it, it feels like for them to win this game, I mean, you're going to have to have elite play on defense and special teams and maybe even a defensive or special teams touchdown. And they may have to actually put points on the board, not just control field position. Uh, you talked about Quinn. Ewers, I mean, they, needed, they needed that against Auburn. Like, think about it. If that yeah. pick six doesn't happen, they lose the football game. They, I, I, I mean, I even not, if it's just a bad pass and it's not picked off, right? Now you're yeah, asking. Then, 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 then Oklahoma is game losing that football game. Yeah, then Oklahoma's losing that football game without the pick six. And look, Quinn Ewers has certainly had his turnover problems before. Like, he's really, really good. And then he'll make a throw every now and then where you're like, what, what, what were you looking like? First play of the, of, of Red River last year, you're like, dude, he's squatting on the inside breaking route. What are you looking at, man? But when I saw him go against that Michigan defense, which is still really good, not as good as last year, but really good, he looks confident, bordering on cocky, which is right where I want my quarterback to be. Make good reads, confident throws, and a guy who is in sync with his play caller because they've got a lot of time spent together. Whereas on the other side, Oklahoma is replacing their offense coordinator, and this is going to be game number two with, with, with Hawkins starting at quarterback. Like, I, 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 I have no instinct to pick Oklahoma in this football game. Absolutely not. And yeah, I'm not I mean, just saying really that because of, Norman is. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm not. Just, I'm not just saying that because I'm on a Texas podcast here. Like I look at that 14 and a half number, and look, I, I don't think this is going to be you know 49 nothing from a couple of years ago. I think Oklahoma's defense is too good for that. But a lot more attention is going to be paid to the Sooners' defense because. It's their greatest strength, but Texas is an incredibly balanced team. And what I love about the Longhorns is that they have a lot of different ways that they can beat you. They have a lot of different ways they can win a football game. I think they can run the ball. And I know the C.J. Baxter injury kind of warded people off, but I looked at Jaden Blue and was like, I don't know, have you watched this guy's film? Have you watched him play football before? And have you seen running backs in Sark's offense? They all tend to succeed. And so everything about this game lines up for Texas. So I think Longhorn fans should be really confident going into this game, but also understand there's a high pressure environment for Sark because if you lose this game, that reflects very poorly on this, on, on this Texas football team. Not, not the program as a whole, but this team specifically. Everything should favor Texas here, but they can run it. They can be creative. They can take deep shots. They can kill the clock. I love the way they come out in the first halves. I do wonder if they, you know, have a little bit of what we've seen from Sark teams over the years where they kind of slow down in the second half or they kind of get off script and, you know, like the Michigan game, for instance. And I know Michigan has good defense, but you scored, what was it, 24 points in, in the first half? It was 24, 24 to 3. And then in the second half, one scoring drive. Like, that's something we've seen before. However, as I said earlier, I, I don't think Oklahoma could overcome something like that. And I think this game could look a lot like Texas, Michigan. <laughs> well, you know, hopefully for me, that's the case. Uh, last <laughs> question I want to ask you, you know, you talked about Quinn Ewers and just brought up his strengths. Uh, obviously, the conversation for the last couple of weeks around the Texas Longhorns, a lot of it is centered around Arch Manning, right? But Quinn Ewers back at practice last week. We know that Arch QB1 Manning is on Texas. No way. Yeah. Right. Never would have thought. <laughs> Where do you think? a quarterback like Quinn Ewers coming back gives Texas an advantage as opposed to maybe having to start an Arch Manning in Red River. We know Quinn's coming back, but like what advantage do you think that presents for Texas getting QB1 back, right? Because it, Arch it, has yeah. obviously been good enough for Texas to win games. But like you said, this is a different environment. Yeah, I mean, if Vegas likes Texas minus 14 and a half, I think without Quinn, that number's probably under a touchdown. You know, and Arch looked really good in a smaller sample size against competition, not as stiff as what Oklahoma's defense brings to the table. And I, I think it, you know, was really a blessing in disguise that you get Arch those reps and come 2025, boy, he sure looks like he, he's capable of being ready. I'd like to see him do it against someone who Texas is not vastly superior to from a roster standpoint, but against the G5 teams, you know, he wasn't super high completion at the start. But then he got more efficient as time went on. He showed off the arm. He's got the mobility. Like there, There's plenty of talent there. But Quinn Ewers is one of the biggest reasons why I'm so confident in Texas here. And, you know, what are my uh, sticking points on Locked On College Football all offseason has been? I, I am inclined to pick in favor of and like the prospect of a team to succeed if they return some combination of head coach, 
quarterback, offensive coordinator. You give me two of those three coming back, I think you're going to be in a really good spot. And Texas, of course, has all three because Sark calls the plays, he's head coach, and Quinn Ewers is there, and they were a very good team last year. So I've liked Texas uh, all offseason, and I, I, I think they're going to win this football game, but Quinn Ewers it is a huge reason why. And if it's Arch Manning, that just becomes a question, not not a doubt for me, but a question about, uh, with, with regards to you're facing a real defense now. This is not Louisiana Monroe. This is not Mississippi State or UTSA. This is Oklahoma, and that's a real defense over there. And if Arch has to come into this game because Quinn gets knocked out and Arch proves it, all right, I'll come on here and say, yeah, okay, that, that guy's definitely the real deal. But Quinn Ewers playing, essential to my confidence in Texas. For sure. Great stuff, as always, from Spencer McLaughlin, Locked on College Football. I imagine I will be my on comments Locked will be very popular football. on uh, this particular show. <laughs> For sure. And I will be on Locked on College Football later this week, so you'll definitely get to hear more Spencer McLaughlin. And like he said, very confident in Texas, as you all are this Saturday against the Oklahoma Sooners in the Red River Robbery. All right, today's episode of Locked on Longhorns also brought to you by Return on You or Roy. All right, Longhorn fans, the Roy app lets you directly support your favorite athletes. Unlike collectives where you make a donation to a general fund, Roy lets you choose the specific athlete you want to support, you back the players you care about, and in return get exclusive content after the season like personal videos and updates. And the best part is risk-free if the athlete transfers or doesn't create the content, you get your money back. Plus, Roy, Return on You is doing their part to bring fans closer to their schools and athletes with an exciting giveaway. Roy or Return on You is giving one lucky fan two tickets to any game of their choice in November. So here's how to enter. Just download Roy in the App Store or Google Play. Use code Locked On when signing up and you, you are entered. Already on Roy, make a payment to any athlete's campaign. And you'll also be automatically entered. No purchase necessary. Void where prohibited. Go to joinroy.com for official rules. Download Roy and try it out. There's no subscription, no recurring fees. And for as little as $10, you can get in the NIL game. Roy, support the players. Change the game. All right. Getting into my top five Heisman candidates going into week seven now of college football. Yeah, going into week seven now of college football, top five Heisman candidates going into week seven. All right, so number five, I still got Jalen Milrow. I pushed him down to number five after being number one after beating Georgia, but that's obviously a very embarrassing loss, but he still has put up great numbers this season. Just a really bad loss to Vandy, but as Spencer said, nobody has really just, there haven't been a ton of candidates making a name for themselves. There haven't really been a ton of candidates that are screaming, I want the Heisman this year. So I still got Jalen Milrow at number five, 1,557 yards and 20 touchdowns up until this point. Bad loss to Vandy as the number one team in the country. A player like Jalen Milrow should go in there and be able to get a win. He didn't. So I got him number five in my Heisman rankings after being number one going into week six. We got Dylan Gabriel, number four, right? Oregon is back in the top five. They were the number three team, I believe, um, to start the season somewhere in the top five. And a couple of close games, right? They haven't lost a game, but a couple of close games moved them down out of the top five, but they're back into the top five because of some chaos. Dylan Gabriel's been all right this year, three interceptions, but he does have 1,520 total yards and 14 touchdowns, pretty high completion percentage. So I got Dylan Gabriel at number four. Number three, coming off a of bye week, nobody's really, you know, did anything to replace him. Travis Hunter, 561 receiving yards and six touchdowns. He's been elite on that side of the ball and on the defensive side of the ball, almost 20 tackles and three forced turnovers, include a couple, including a game winning turnover as well. So Travis Hunter, number three on my list. Number two, even though they've almost lost their last two games, had to come back from 25 points down last week, Cam Ward, right? If there's any quarterback that deserves to be up in the, uh, the Heisman rankings right now, Cam Ward, 2,380 total yards and 23 touchdowns. Like I said, they've almost lost, but almost doesn't mean much. <laughs> it really doesn't mean anything in football, right? Your goal is to go out there and win games. And Cam Ward has been absolutely phenomenal. Like I said, you know, over 250 passing yards in the fourth quarter against Cal, overcoming a 25-point deficit. Cam Ward is doing everything in his power to win the Heisman. And normally he would be number one 
But like I said, G5 player or not, you have to salute what Ashton GT has been doing through five games, a thousand and fifty total yards. And only 19 of those, I think, are passing yards or receiving yards. Excuse me. Like he's getting it all on the ground, averaging 11 yards a carry and 16 total touchdowns. I don't care if he's a G5 player. He did it against Oregon as well. Right. Ashton GT is putting up insane numbers that you can't even duplicate damn near on NCAA 25. We might have to make an exception for him this year, right? Right now, there is no question in my mind he is the lead in Heisman candidate. So those are my top five Heisman guys going into week seven of college football. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Locked On Longhorns, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hook them. Peace.